Hello everybody, welcome back. This is Jonathan Gardner, and this video is part of the Theory of Python video series, uh, which is covering not only Python and the details of it, but also more about computer science and how to be a good software engineer. Drawing on my experience, 20 years in the industry, doing all kinds of stuff. All right, software development process. This is an overview. This is kind of like a high level view of the different aspects of software development, how we actually do software. So there are basically two models that people follow. One is called the waterfall. This is also called traditional. And then the other is called agile. So I'm gonna cover really high level what these things are. Th this one, you're gonna hear the word scrum when people are talking about agile. Okay, what is waterfall? What is a traditional method? How does it work? Well, you first, do what might be called the requirements phase. In the requirements phase, you figure out what it is the software is supposed to do, what it is the users want the software to do, and what other projects your software is gonna interact with, and the requirements that say this is what it must do to be successful at all, right? And you set kind of priorities. You say like these are things we might say the MVP, minimum vile product, product, and then you might say these are nice to haves, right? And there's some kind of priority between the different features that are requirements for this thing. And so you'd spend in the traditional method, you'd spend like a month, two months, three months, four months, six months, just researching and figuring out the requirements. And this is a lot of market research. It's a lot of talking with users and doing some testing and discovery and stuff like that. It's a lot, it's a long process. And then after you get all of your requirements satisfied or figured out, the next thing you're going to do is you're going to build the design. And what the design does is it shows how we're going to actually implement those requirements. What programs we're going to write, what computers we need, what the protocols are going to be, how it's going to be organized. And you also start doing things like figuring out the timelines for when stuff needs to happen by, you know, component A needs to be finished before component B can be worked on, things like that. And so you spend months and months and months figuring out the design. You talk amongst people that understand software and software development. And you review and you argue and you figure it out and you get a design put together. Okay. And then you go into the implementation phase. So you hire a bunch of programmers, you clear out the floor of an office building, you hand them the design and the requirements, and you say, go for it. You have X amount of time to do this. And this implementation phase could take months and months, and even years sometimes, okay? And then once you get the software working, then you start and you go into the testing or the acceptance phase. And in this phase, you hire a bunch of other kinds of engineers and they look at the software, they figure out what's wrong with it, they make bug reports, it goes back to the engineers that wrote the software, they fix those things, so you have to revisit the design. Sometimes you have to go back and revisit the requirements. But the testing acceptance phase is important because the next thing you're going to do after you've tested and you made sure that everything works, then you are going to ship the software, okay? And then after you ship the software, that's when you make your money. Congratulations, you're a rich man, okay? And this is the way software, basically any engineering project traditionally has been done and it's a very successful, it's a very effective model. The thing is, it just takes a lot of time, right? Okay. Now the Agile system is exactly the same as the Waterfall system, except for some very important differences, okay? Number one, you do days or weeks, not months, okay? So the requirements phase might just be a few hours where you kind of spitball out and say, what do we want the software to do? The design phase could just be a day, right? It's a very short amount of time to do these things. The implementation phase, we're gonna break that up into two steps. So we do, do implementation, we're gonna do like a prototyping phase. And then we're gonna do what, what I might call the, um, the polishing phase. Okay. In the prototyping phase, what you do is you quickly put together software that is crappy it has a lot of bugs, but it basically gives you an idea on how the design and the requirements are gonna work. And then once you get a prototype that you like or you think is successful, then you start spending some time on it actually figuring it out and making it work nice, okay? Now the testing phase is happening while you're doing prototyping and polishing, right? So we're testing while we write the software. We're not waiting until the software is done and then testing. We're doing it at the same time, okay? And the other thing we're gonna do is we're gonna release early 
and we're going to release often. And this is why you see alpha or beta software. Agile is very popular nowadays, as you probably can tell. This is the way people prefer to do their software. They like to keep things in tight loops of less than a month, generally, and they like to release often. So there's lots of video games, lots of successful video games, where you'll actually get updates to the game every day. You know, just small little changes that are happening all the time. Okay. Um, the other thing that's very important about the agile development process is there's a lot of communication, okay? I'm gonna write side channel communication. Okay, whereas over here, you'd have a lot of meetings. You'd schedule time to get everybody in the same room where they can all go over the document together. Over here, a lot of the conversations can't happen in meetings because of the time frame constraints. So you have to be communicating out of band, uh, over email, over lunch. You have to grab people in the hall and stuff like that. So there's a lot of side channel communication that's going on in this, this method, which can be messy if you don't know how to manage that. So, but just understand that all of the communication that would happen here still happens. It just happens much more informally and much more ad hoc. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the different phases, what it means and what things do. Okay, in the requirements phase, okay, it's very important that you prioritize the different features of the software, right? It's very important you identify a minimum set for the minimum viable product, right? The thing that you absolutely must have. And then the nice to haves is, is gonna be arranged from like, if you don't have these, it's kind of pointless, but it's still a good product versus, you know, this, these bells and whistles would be really good to have. A lot of times you can deliver on these later. A lot of times you'll decide that the product itself is not very good, especially when using agile software and you go for a minimum viable product. I think also with the waterfall method, if you take a smaller feature set and tackle it, each of these phases will go a lot faster. And so you can get back and get a better set of requirements next. And that's kind of what the agile discovered is that if you're going back to the design and requirements phase often, and in a cycle of days and weeks rather than years, you're gonna have a better design, okay? And this is something that I'm gonna mention here, it's called OODA, okay? It's called Observe, Orient, Decide, and Act. And the idea is that the faster that you can cycle back, you know, the faster you go from action to observation, and the faster that you can make a decision, the better you'll be able to adapt to the changing circumstances of the industry, of the day, of the people's personalities, of whatever, bugs are discovered on the particular day of the week, okay? Design phase. So it's really important that when you're designing, you try to identify the minimum path, right? How do you get from where we're at to where we need to be? And don't take any side tours. Don't uh, spend time refactoring that you don't need to. And people like to talk about investing. Um, so they do a project and they say, well, the shortest answer would be to do this three-day project, but we're going to invest and take, uh, you know, six days to do this project because we know that there's future projects that are going to use these features. And so we want to make sure that there's the capability to add those features into the future. Be careful, though. Uh, I've seen projects fail because they're just investing too much. They're not actually doing the minimum vial product. They're trying something else out. And so we don't get the feedback from the requirements and from the uh, testing and acceptance and the shipping. We don't get the feedback that we would have had. And it turns out that investment was a bad investment because we're not going that direction after all. So be careful about the investment. Uh, prototyping phase. So what is a prototype? So typically what I do for the prototyping phase, and I'm doing the prototype generally while we're doing design and requirements right, and the Agile philosophy. So while people are talking about, hey, we'd like to have a feature that does X, then I have some code sitting somewhere that does something very close to X, okay? Uh, because that'll help me have a better design. It'll help me understand the requirements better as I write the prototype. And once you get the prototype working, or once you get something that kind of satisfies the design, it's close to it, but not all the way there, then you start focusing on getting all the little I's crossed and the T's, I's dotted and T's crossed. <laughs> you focus on getting the I's dotted, the T's crossed, so that that prototype uh, can actually be released to the public or put in an environment where it won't bring everything down and it has the proper testing and everything like that to go along with it, right? Uh, the testing phase. So 
Typically in the waterfall process, they do the testing after the implementation. I am a huge fan of testing, it's what it's called TDD, test driven development, where you actually start with the tests, right? And so if I were to prototype something, I said like this needs to show this message, then I'd write a test that says, run the software, see if it shows that message. And then the, obviously the test is gonna fail, so then I modify the code until the test passes. Right, And so I already have my test to ensure that that code does what I think it does. And in the future, when somebody comes along to change it again, we just run those same tests all over again. They're automated. We don't have to worry about hiring a bunch of people to run the tests. And so you're, you basically, it's a way to stabilize the code in the midst of all this change. So testing is really important. Um, testing also involves things like integrating the software with other pieces of software. So the tests can be really small. They can be unit tests that are just testing one function, like a tiny bit of functionality of the software, or they can be huge. They can span like the entire system, you know? Like you basically start up an entire system in like a test cluster somewhere, and then you start, you know, throwing data at it, or you throw customer requests or something like that to see what it does. Uh, so anything in between as well. The, you also have to worry about optimization as part of your testing, right? Does the code run fast enough? Uh, oftentimes, speed of your code is not the bottleneck, right? So when you do your optimization phase, it'll help expose what the bottlenecks are. And um, in my experience, especially with Python, the code is not the bottleneck, your design is the bottleneck. You need to think of a better algorithm to use for that particular feature set or something like that. Uh, something else that we kind of talk about but we never do is documentation. So having a good set of documentation that matches the code is critical so that uh, the poor person who has to come back and work on the software later will know what he's doing. And that typically that poor person is you. So it's a documentation, I consider them um, love messages, you know, to yourself in the future. Because when you see those messages in the documentation, you're gonna say, oh man, I totally love that guy that wrote that, you know. Also, if you're going on a new project or you're transferring from a project, that's kind of the wrong time to write the documentation. The docs should already be in place, um, written at the time that it was written. And if the docs are there, the transition is so much easier than if you didn't have the docs there. Uh, delivery, when you release, uh, there's gonna be some kind of checklist that you follow to make sure that you're not releasing crap, okay? And there's a process that you follow to make sure that the release goes smoothly. Um, if you can, you're gonna automate as much as you can. Uh, speaking of automation, um, there's that popular meme But the nice thing about software is you can automate all the things. Everything you do as a software developer can be automated. There's certain things that don't make sense to automate. Uh, the general rule of thumb is if you do it once, then that's fine. If you do it twice, you should automate it so you don't have to do it ever again. And um, there's actually a very popular program. It's a piece of free software that I love telling people about. It's called Make. Uh, probably one of the greatest pieces of software ever written. And so you can encode basically anything you want into the Make file and then you can have that behavior automated and Make works everywhere, even on Windows. Make is awesome, okay? So this is an overview of the software development process. Uh, obviously, there's not a lot of details here and you're gonna have a ton of questions. Uh, people that have done this several times, they're just probably nodding their heads like, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, people that are new to it, if you have questions, please ask the questions. I will make more videos diving into these topics as you guys request them. Uh, if there's interest for something, I'll go into what something means, what it, what you should think about when you're doing it, um, and uh, things like that. So if you have questions, if you want elaborations, please ask me. Hey guys, I hope you have a great day. Take care, and bye-bye. This video is part of a series on the theory of Python. You can click on the left to see the playlist, and on the right to support my channel. Thank you very much for your time.